Kelly Kazer Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieKesserJane.com. And I actually was the first person on NPR and on the CBS Morning Show and on Bill Maher's show to talk about the dry vagina. Well, I'm just making history here. <laughs> Did she say dry vagina? Ah, the comedy of Annabelle Gerwich. Hi, and welcome to the Halle Caster Jane Show. I am Halle Caster Jane. Thank you so much for tuning in. Joining me at my table today is not one, but two ladies of comedy. Up first, Annabelle Gerwitz, author of I See You Made an Effort, Compliments, Indignities, and Survival Stories from the Edge of 50. And that lady of satire, Liz Winstead, author of Liz Free or Die, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, who's the funniest of them all. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to The Halle Caster Chain Show. The Halle Caster Chain Show is always available online at hallycasterchain.com and a host of venues, including Blog Talk Radio. But be sure to visit us at our newest home on iHeart Radio. Today, The Halle Caster Chain Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Halle Caster Chain Show. Is someone you love living with frequent pain? Are they spending more time just sitting in a chair or lying in bed or going to the ER more often? Other than taking them to the doctor, you may not know what else to do. Treasure Coast Hospice can help in more ways than you may realize. Even if you don't think your loved one is ready for hospice care, their experts can evaluate your loved one's condition and direct you to the right resources in our community. Call Treasure Coast Hospice to learn more or visit tchospice.org. Pour yourself a martini. Grab a spot on your favorite sofa and listen to the great artists, writers, politicians, and celebrities of our day stir things up. On the Halle Caster Jane Show. New podcast posted Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern at HalleCasterJane.com. Actress, comedian, writer Annabel Gerwich is the author of You Say Tomato, I Say Shut Up. Now a play receiving its third national tour and Fired, which became an acclaimed documentary and Showtime comedy special. Annabelle gained a loyal comedic following during her years hosting Dinner and a Movie on TBS and has been a regular commentator on NPR and contributor to The Nation, Moore, Glamour, Marie Claire, and a number of other national publications. Her acting credits include over 50 guest roles in shows including Seinfeld, Boston Legal, Dexter, and hosting programs on Planet Green Network, The Style Channel, and HBO. Recently, she started in the world premiere of A Coney Island Christmas at the Geffen Playhouse in L.A. And then, Annabelle turned 50, becoming a statistic, one of the many Americans who every seven and a half seconds reaches the milestone, the subject of her book, I See You Made an Effort, Compliments, Indignities, and Survival Stories from the Edge of 50. Let's talk. All right, ladies. So I want to officially welcome you to the club, my hilarious girlfriend. If no one else has 50, you're an atheist, so you can't say, oh, God, I'm 50. What do you oh, say about say, turning oh, 50? Oh, God, I'm 50. Absolutely, because I'm not 50, because my intention had been to write this book, which I started when I was 49, 48, 49, and, um, and have it come out when I turned 50, and it was going to be a big party, but uh, it took me longer to write it because of the menopausal brain so I was actually 52 when it came out and I just turned 53 which is actually now it's very convenient that the title is 
I see you made an effort, compliments, indignities, and survival stories from the edge of 50. I consider the edge of 50 to be anywhere from 40 till death. <laughs> Until death, okay. So talk to me. The Ed Maybe Camp- even after. So, even after death. Even after death? I don't want to go that far. Listen, the Ed campaign keeps telling us that we're not getting older, we're getting better. You buying it? Well, that was one of my inspirations for writing this book. I grew up in the 70s, and I remember those Clairol commercials. You're not getting older, you're getting better. And as a matter of fact, I might be getting better, but I'm also getting older. Clairol, big surprise, lied to us. I, I, I started to think that it was really a canard, this whole, you know, 50 is the new 40. Actually, if you really take it all that way, then 20 is the new 10. And having a teenager, I could say that is probably true. My, my son, who's 16, is like a fetus, <laughs> the brain power. But I, I really felt it was a disservice and doing a disservice to this age, which is an age that I think is something to be reckoned with. And, of course, you know, it, it's not just a matter of how you look and the exterior. It's all those things that happen to you at this age, including, you know, for me, the end of fertility, which was a, a very big thing. You know, before you get to be this age, there are, you know, this is the, there are things that, that, that can still happen, you know, and that was the First, I think, and perhaps ridiculous kind of, uh, I should have known, I should have acknowledged many other finalities in my life. But, you know, that one that, well, even if I, not that I wanted to have men children, <laughs> I couldn't have, but just that there's an end mark to something is a really profound thing. So, you know, this book is a, is a, is a um, collection of essays and they're comedic essays. But I, I think, you know, at the heart of this whole book is really this, you know, this question of how do we, how do we age? How do we, how do we, how do we do that? Okay, two things. I'm looking at you and you're adorable and you have great <laughs> hair. So yeah. thank you, Clairol, in case you were using it. I love your hair. Uh, sure. Great cut. Super. No question about it. But let's talk this men a pause you ever have a problem with that word i do men a pause who came up with men a pause have you ever thought about that i have i you know listen that's just the 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 tip of it um in my book if you're someone who likes footnotes and facts and research and all you will enjoy the footnotes because what i've done is you know there's quite a number of things just speaking about the kind of lexicon you know of uh of menopause and and the kind of uh not even just the word itself but all those related words, words that, that women start to, to hear about, hormone replacement therapy and, <laughs> and, um, and, and all the things that are recommended for a woman of a certain age. I track in my book all the things that are not in the Apple Dictionary, <laughs> all the things that were not in my Mac computer that just, you know, bioidentical, bioidentical, not in there, cosmeceutical. There's a billion-dollar cosmeceutical industry directed at women in menopause, not in there either. So, you know, it was just one of those sort of fun things to think about. Well, I don't know who came up with the word menopause or any of these other words, but they are, it's like they're outside the realm of uh, men and, and, and who who are the majority of programmers? And, uh, and I just thought that was an interesting little thing. I don't like that word. I mean, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, let me just say, this book is not a book specifically about menopause. It is about this particular time in life, which, of course, is shaded by these things, of course. But um, it's each chapter deals with a various ways that you realize your life has changed and how that 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 how that appears and so there's there's the chapter about you know I do write a lot about the sandwich generation um, that's another one of those names it was coined by a, a male sociologist and that term refers to people who are I'm not sure what year born I was born in 1961 considered a tail end baby boomer which is also a terrible phrase <laughs> tail end what I'm like the ass of the baby boomer <laughs> What? Sure. What? <laughs> um, Stop it. <laughs> so uh, the sagging ass of the baby boomers, the tail end. <laughs> so we are the tail end baby boomers who have had children late, statistically speaking, and we uh, have children at home. 
Raising Children at Home, while we are dealing with um, middle age issues, including uh, trying to stay visible and viable as an economy, new health concerns, and at the same time, we are dealing with aging parents. So we're stretched in between, and the sandwich refers to how we're getting squeezed. And there's a terrible word for us because I had to give up carbs. <laughs> you too. <laughs> You're going to just remind me of that by talking about bread? That was a guy who came up with that phrase. I hate it. But um, I write about sandwich generation issues. My sister and I moving my parents from their home, selling our childhood home, moving them to the next place, a senior retirement facility. I deal with being the parent of a teenager while I'm hitting this age and the indignities that go along with that, trying to work at this age, the health issues. There's you know, a plethora of ways in which, I mean, there's a way in which also your brain, which you realize you're different. I, I took my son to see a concert, and, I'm, and I write the story in the book, but this was one of those first moments that I, that I realized I was becoming invisible. I looked at this lead singer, first of all. He's skinny, <laughs> adorable, and so skinny, and I wasn't thinking about taking him home and having my way with him. I was thinking about taking him home and packing him nutritious snacks for the road. <laughs> the brain has changed. My brain has changed. But I also realized that in that concert situation that I was completely invisible to that band. It was a small, it was an intimate group. And in that concert, the, the, the band ooh, sings kind of political songs or they pretentiously believe they sing political songs the way that one can when you are that age that you're in an indie punk band traveling the country in a van. And uh, they, uh, they were charging everyone there. They were looking everyone in the eye in the audience, all these teenagers, and charging them to change the world. And I realized they can't even see me. They're not addressing me. Einstein's theory of parallel worlds was correct age has spun me into an alternate <laughs> universe you know so it, it's you know there's a I'm, I'm looking at you know this the global sense in which on in very small ways as a matter of fact you realize that your life has changed <laughs> to say the least i want to talk about the cover of this book of yours it's hilarious a pink granny pants which yeah. eerily remind me by the way of the fancy pants that i bought from my niece when she was two years uh-huh. old uh-huh. and i'm uh-huh. looking at the cover of your book and i'm going potty trained or incontinence <laughs> depends or what well, i want to just talk about that for a second so okay so any author you know this it's always controversial like what's going to be on your cover even though and the funny thing is is of course you know, this kind of cover thing is, you know, um, perhaps a little bit less of an issue now that people read on Nooks and Kindles and all the different ways they read because, I mean, that was one of the great things is that I like as a reader and as a writer is that you would walk down the street, you'd see someone reading a book, you're on the subway, you see someone reading a book and, you know, that cover you, you can see what it is now. You know who knows? It's 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 it's, it's a it's there. They've turned books into um, the sex toy industry, which you you know you. Uh oh, here am I revealing this. You know you'd buy stuff and they would they put it in a unlabeled brown paper bag so <laughs> no one could see it. Now now people know that I have shopped in sex toy stores. Okay, so but so um, when they showed me this cover, I immediately hated it, and then. <laughs> The second choice that they showed me, and I'm just sure that they did this, I'm sure my publisher did this as a way of convincing me to get this cover, <laughs> was they showed me a cover with a woman with a bucket over her head. <laughs> oh, and I thought, oh my God, I mean, you know, this book is a book really ultimately, a, it's an, I believe that what I'm what I've written is an empowering book because I believe I've had enough therapy. I mean, I started out as an actress. You name the kind of therapy, I've done it. But, you know, I really believe that thing about when you can bring things, when you can bring things out into the open, it's a great way of becoming empowering. And I actually was the first person on NPR and on the CBS Morning Show and on Bill Maher's show to talk about the dry vagina. Well, I'm just making history here but so you know that was a terrible idea a bucket over the head so I was like okay let's go back to the granny panties and the, the funny thing is is you know um, they're funny it's funny they're granny panties the thing about them is if you look at the cover 
They are cute granny panties. Those are actually very sexy. I thought so. I thought so. I don't know about uh, sexy, but cute. They, but I think they're very cute, and um, they also strategically cover that area where the waistline <laughs> once was. And um, I mean, that's the thing is, you know, I never wanted to get a tattoo until I got to be this age, and I actually considered having the tattoo under new management, <laughs> right, <laughs> right uh, above my C-section scar, people. That's what I would oh, give me a break. You're but, such a pistol you are. Now, hush for a second. I want to ask you about something. I want yes. to talk to you about the fact that you now live in L.A., which is the yes. hedonistic capital of the world, but you were born and raised in Miami Beach, the second, mm-hmm. the runner-up hedonistic capital of the world. So what about plastic surgery? I want to talk to you about that. And, and do you consider it when you were 10? <laughs> do you see something, anything wrong with it? I call it a little repair work. You are listening to the Hallie Kessler Jane Show, always available online at HallieKesserJane.com. Today, I'm speaking with Annabelle Gerwich. A little repair work. Listen, you know, I write about this in, in my book with hopefully a sense of humor. It's such a strange world that we live in. I write in the book about how a friend of mine, who our friendship was based on the fact that I was always better looking than her, <laughs> not that she knew that. <laughs> but, but, I've had a few of those. <laughs> But now she's had such good work done. She's cuter than me. It so pisses me off. It's so unfair because people who didn't know us as kids, who I grew up with, like they, she's just cute. God damn it! It's so oh, I curse. It's so unfair. So here's the thing. You know, I write that in Los Angeles after the big earthquake hits, women unrecognizable to their own assistants will be roaming the streets looking for Botox, which if I'm smart, I will stockpile and sell out of the trunk of my car. I honestly, and you know, this is the thing. I honestly, I, I'm walking a middle road and I write about this in my book with great candor because I think one of the very confusing things about the world we live in is that there is some work that is so good now you can't even see it. So the problem is as we, Joe Public person, me, I include myself in this because I can't afford the really good work, you know, you look and you go like, oh, I want to age like this person or that person. You, you sort of look to have role models and you can't tell what people are doing because the really good stuff you can't even see. You think they're doing nothing. And I, I mean, you know, but then again, that, that asks the question. I mean, I try to be I'm trying to be provocative in the book. I don't have answers, but who do I look to as a role model? I look to Jane Goodall. I love the I love the work that Jane Goodall does. At the same time, when I look at her, she looks so great. I wonder what kind of sunscreen she's using. So I write about in the book all the little things that I've tried: Botox, I've tried Juvederm. I don't have any right now. I just can't afford any right now because I I have actually liked this stuff it can make you and does it make you look younger no does it make you look better oh who knows because the problem is it only lasts for a little while then it's almost worse because you go back looking older than you look to begin it's, it's all silly but it's you know we are vain creatures or i'm a vain creature i'm and it's not even because i've been an actress i'm just i'm i'm a vain person but you know i'm trying to walk a middle road and i don't subscribe to any plastic surgery shaming and you know of course no one wants to cross over to what I call monster face when you look like you've changed species but (laughs) I I have compassion for everyone and how hard it is to to find a way because all these things are available to, to negotiate I mean where does it end if you start saying oh I would never do plastic surgery well are you going to dye your hair are you going to work out do you use makeup up. I mean, where do you where do you draw the line? It's a very slippery slope. And um, I do know one thing is that I have seen the future. I've seen my mother's gobbler. And um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to afford to do, because let's face it, it's it, I, I had the temerity to major in the humanities instead of the amenities. <laughs> big mistake. Um, I am thinking I will have a little accident on a staircase. I will be walking upstairs, have an accident in the gobbler area, which will require medical attention some 
emergency surgery that will be covered by my health insurance plan. One, a girl can hope. That's my plan. That's your plan. I, what's with this brain of yours? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Are you like you ever stop? Does the brain ever slow down? Do you like when you go to sleep? Are you thinking funny? What the? You are a trip. I had no idea. I think that's sweet. It is a bit. No, 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 no. I meant it as a compliment. Seriously. You know, I talk to people all day long. I you know. are like, uh, like. You're like a rapid fire. Go, 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 go. I mean, give me this brain. That's just my brain. That is just the way the brain works. That is just the, that's, that's, that's my, my brain. Always Um, been like that? Always. And menopause, any effect? What, what's that? And menopause, any effect? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Slow it down. Listen, (laughs) I meditate. Oh, shoot. (laughs) And 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 I'm still like this. There's a chapter on meditation in my book where I just, I give the inner thoughts of the world's worst meditator, which is me. Because I just, I hate all these books and people who are talking about how great meditation is for your life and they're thinking these amazing thoughts. I'm meditating and I'm thinking about bread, bread that I can't eat anymore. I, you know, so. Now, and I'm um, thinking to myself, you are not the poster child for meditation. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I actually think about it. I am the poster child. Oh, you child do? You think so, huh? How's that? I, I'm the person who should be meditating. And, you know, I, I listen, if I can re- just, if I can string a sentence together, because my brain is mostly um, filled with trying to remember internet passwords. <laughs> this is, it's a good day if I can, if I can think things. And that's. You know, that's that's what I'm trying to do is, you know, you know, find a way to write these things down and, and in, a, in a coherent fashion. That's 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 how I spend that's my time. That's how you spend your time. So listen to me. You're married. Yes. To actor, producer and sometime partner Jeff Kahn. Yes. I don't know how long you guys have been married. 18 years. That's a very, well, my and marriage is put together aren't one eighteenth of I that. You go, talking, girl. And, 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 and we live in Los Angeles, no um, less. Yeah, like, what's the secret? But here's the deal. Aren't you glad going through all of this that you're married? Could you imagine having to go through this dating? Well, um, uh, no. Like me. <laughs> yes and no. Well, you know, um, it's so funny you say that because there's a chapter in my book about that very thing because I actually... That was one of my goals was, you know, I, I, in trying to cover all the issues that a person can face at this age, I have a number of single friends and I wanted, I know that some of my readers are not married. And so I took a class in uh, dating for women of a certain age and that would be this age. And it was hilarious and I wanted to kill myself at the time. <laughs> and, um, but I, I and, and I think that my readers who are single will appreciate that. And the funny thing is is uh, I, I have a friend, my sister, recently single in her 50s, has met a fabulous person. They've been dating for a number of years and I believe they met on match. Really? So never no. Then again, I write in my book about my friend Christine, who's my age, and uh, she, her husband left her for a woman that they met in their church marriage counseling group. <laughs> That's bad. And uh, he left her for this woman. And um, she went on match, and she was matched with two people. The first person she was matched with was her brother. And the oh. second was a homeless man who went by the name Bling Bling. <laughs> so it is a very challenging time, and I wanted to I wanted to reflect that by writing about that experience and and taking this class and writing about that world and and that was that was a really fun and and, and terrifying little excursion and and I learned how to write a, a I learned how to write a profile and pick a name on a dating site and. And then a couple of tricks, which, which I wrote about in the book. And having a 16-year-old son, give or take a few at the time this was all beginning, as you were changing, <laughs> as you were morphing, <laughs> going towards that. How is that? Is that like a reflection back like, you son of a gun, I remember when I was young and wasn't that wonderful? Or is that a, geez, I don't really want to have to deal with a 16-year-old who's having his own problems because he's going through puberty. I mean, you know, it's a trippy time also, that balance with kids. It's the perfect storm. <laughs> it's a perfect storm. Tell He's me, got too many hormones. I don't have any. He's raging. I'm raging. There is the very limited amount of things that are allowed for the mothers of teenagers. I'm not allowed to sing. 
can't make eye contact in public, can't ask about school, can't ask about girls. I chew too loudly. <laughs> the timbre of my voice is annoying. I'm not allowed to sigh. Oh, too old. Can't make say oi. Too Jewish. <laughs> I'm not allowed to be nude oi. within 100 feet of him, even if the door is closed. It's, no. a, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It's, it's a, nightmare. a nightmare. Does he have any pity on you at all? Or, you, or none? <laughs> Um, he yeah. has so little pity and sympathy for me. Oh, and it's like, Mom, what are you wearing? Mom, okay, this was the height of it. I asked him to shoot my book video for me. And right before we started shooting, he says to me, Mom, you look like Bubby. You look like Grandma. Oh. And, uh, he said it with so much, like, it was so not with one of his mean things he was saying that I knew that it was just true. <laughs> <laughs> it was so awful. It was so... Oh, I'll share you with, with one from it. My mother takes me to the plastic surgeon, right? Single again. We got to have a little repair work. Because she takes me to the plastic surgeon, looks at me, and he goes, look, behold your future. <laughs> I was like, give me whatever you're going to give me. That's yeah, hard, particularly for me. Jewish girls, right? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. true. It's so true. Annabelle, yeah. you keep talking about this. You keep talking about women of a certain age. How about men of a certain age? What's the deal? Why are we? Why is it all on us? Well, it's certainly not. And you know, one of the things I was thinking about in writing this book was writing about writing material. And I do have a lot of male readers. Uh, I, writing writing about uh, the the non gender specific experience, which this age is as well. You know, everybody struggles with uh, the memory about. I mean, internet passwords, usernames, <laughs> the, 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 the horror of not being born into the digital uh, generation, but having, but living in that generation. It's, it's, um, you know, it, it is a challenge. I think, you know, for men, I mean, I watch my husband go through this and I, you know, I write about this too in, in our, in my book about being in the middle of a marriage or in the middle or 18 years into a marriage and my husband's. I would say disdain for me, but I would say contempt might be the better. I mean, it's um, it is a, it is a, you know, it is a challenge on so many levels. The the issue of dealing with parents who are getting older is also a, a nightmare. It, 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 it's a non gender specific issue. And this thing that I had, you know, I had a tennis accident, which when I went to the doctor, I went to the orthopedic doctor, and he said I he diagnosed me as having boomeritis. Whoa. And that's a medically recognized term now for having a sports injury, for exercising as though you think you are younger than you actually are. Did you kill him? <laughs> I wanted to kill him. And that is something that is also something that, you know, you don't have to be a woman to have. I also have osteoarthritis. That's so much fun. <laughs> so I write about my first trip to my rheumatologist. Did I ever think that I would have a rheumatologist? <laughs> I mean, what the fuck? Yeah, it's, 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 Dr. Nuji told me that there was no cure for what I had, and it was a genetic thing. And, and you know, I mean, these are, these are experiences that we have, you know, whether we're men or we're women, where we know that at this point in our lives, the words for the rest of your life, you know, are attached to certain experiences, uh, which is where sense of humor, red wine, and a very... <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and good friends come in. I mean, those are three things I think that are essential at this age. Having have you know, I think that it's interesting when, if you, particularly if you have kids, you know, you get really caught up in the the kid raising community when you're younger. And at this age, I have found one of the really essential things is to have a community of women, of men, of, of support of people that, and I say support, I mean people to either hike with or exercise with or have a drink with, you know, just people that to have friends. And also, I mean, one of the, um, one of the things that is a great thing about being this age is I mentor a lot of people. That's really fun for me. Um, you know, you, I feel like, you know, uh, if you can do 
some of this, you know, um, if you can find some usefulness, that's a way of keeping, I'm being serious now, sorry, uh, but, you know, a way of keeping visible in the world. No, oh, that's, you can be serious. Serious is good. Yep. Serious yep. Uh, serious certainly works. And there is a serious undertone to all of this, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for all the fun that we're having doing this. Uh, I'm going to bring up a name. I'm going to bring it up because I want him to come on the show <laughs> if I give him PR. <laughs> our, old, our mutual, my old friend, Richard Lewis. Oh, Richie, you know, yeah. yeah, Richie, you were the only two people in the world to call him Richie because he has a heart attack if somebody calls him Richie. You hear that, Richie? I'm calling you Richie. I so relate to the, this is what he wrote uh, a blurb for your book. I so relate to this brilliant and wildly hilarious latest work by Annabelle Gurich. I love your name. That sadly, I think there is middle-aged women's body trying to break out of my own. So maybe it is a men's <laughs> trip as well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Well, um. No, I don't think he's going to, you know, Richard calls himself, Richard Lewis calls himself the Prince of Pain. So he's not going to mind if I say, if you want to talk about, you know, uh, someone who talks about the the indignities that one experiences, all you have to do is look to his writing. He's he's the king of that. So I know he relates to so many things in, in my book. And my friend Bill Maher. I mean, actually, the funny thing is, is half the blurbs from my book I know. were from men. Bob <laughs> Odenkirk from Breaking I saw Bad. That. I loved it. Bill Maher, because it 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 affects everyone. You know, I mean, this is the it, this is the indignity of of aging. You know, um, Mike Nichols yeah, passed what away, a long, and yeah. um, what a, a, a amazing inspiration for so many people. I. You know, not just me personally, but it's funny because it reminded me of something. When I read that news, I was reminded of when I went on CBS Early Morning and I was having a conversation with Charlie Rose about this book. And he said, he said, you know, Annabelle, my friend Mike Nichols said to me when I was a younger man, Charlie, there will come a day when women on the street won't notice you anymore and if they do stop you it's not to get your number because they want to date you they stop you because they want direction <laughs> and so it affects everyone this idea of in uh, of invisibility yeah, yeah um and how we don't want to become invisible i you know i i thought about that gail she has a wonderful quote about being invisible at 50. Go look that up. She's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks, and I can't wait to talk to her about that because that I carried that around for mm-hmm. a long time, her quote, and I wish I could say it to you. Last mm-hmm. thing is you've survived 50. I have survived. <laughs> You're on your way to, oh, my real God. I can't. <laughs> I can't Can, say it. Do you hear me? to take me there yet? As much as I've made my peace with it, do I need to go there yet? Do I need to? No, I, I, I'm not even, I can't even uh, uh, say it. So, But you know what? In the words of Marie Chevalier, at least that's some people think it came from him. Old age isn't so bad when you consider the alternative correct. Absolutely, which is why I always say when I do an event, I'm going to a lot of cities, I'm on another tour, as I stand here on my good ankle. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be here. <laughs> and does anybody have an aspirin? <laughs> Thanks, Miss Annabelle. You're a trip. Thank you, I think. Thank you, I think. I'll give you I think. Bye. I've been speaking with actress, humorist, and best-selling author Annabelle Gerrich. Her latest book, I See You Made an Effort, compliments, indignities, and survival stories from the edge of of 50 by way of Blue Rider Press, a member of the Penguin Group. For more information on Annabelle Gerwich, visit her website at annabellegerwich.com. A stand-up comedian by trade, Liz Winstead is one of the giants of comedy. Winstead got her start in her native Minneapolis, honing her skills in what she calls the punk rock ghetto of the early 1980s. She dreamed up a new satirical genre for television when she created The Daily Show back in 1996 and was co-founder of the Air America Radio Network, giving Rachel Maddow her first national audience. In her book, Liz Free or Die, Winstead writes of her early years growing up Catholic, getting pregnant the first time she had sex, her move to New York City to follow her calling in comedy, and the many challenges she faced along the way. 
A political activist, Winstead has been stumping for Planned Parenthood, raising money at shows across the country, despite receiving numerous death threats. From the archives of the Hallie Kessler Chain Show, a conversation with satirist Liz Winstead. Let's talk. How are you, Liz? <laughs> well, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there, and you're doing this from an airport, and we so appreciate you're doing that for us. You are uh, Thank in you. where? In o- <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Oklahoma you're City. in Oklahoma? Oh, my gosh, Oklahoma. I'm in Oklahoma City. Yeah. Oh, the, the great Oklahoma City. So talk to me, lady. I mean, really, you have had some career, and you are just, what, what's with your mind? I mean, where did you, where does all this come from? Where does this all, a girl from, where are you from, type. Minneapolis? I can't fight. Yeah, Minneapolis. I had to do something. I don't have any other skills. So I figured jump <laughs> seems to be appropriate. <laughs> None, huh? No other skills. So talk to I me. Can you cook. did grow I can up cook. in. Can you cook? Yeah, oh yeah. Yes, yeah, what's I your can. best, uh, what, what's best? What, tell me what's the best. Uh, thing that, you know, it, it, that's a really loaded question. It's kind of like saying what's your favorite record. Um, or CD, I guess we say now, because I mean, since I just said record, God, shoot me. Just take me at the best. <laughs> um, I would say I make a pretty mean lamb roast. Oh, uh, yeah? I have pasta dishes that are quite incredible. Yeah. Um, Can you have me over I for can... lamb one day? My favorite thing, by the way. It, oh, yeah, absolutely. I Let did. me know. Okay. I will. I will. Absolutely. I used to have a pet lamb, just so you know, on my farm. I had a pet lamb. Um, Liz? Yes? Talk to me. You say that you are an oddball. You're not an oddball. You're a genius. I think they're one and the same. Um, I think genius is something I would never call myself. <laughs> oddball, I'm much more comfortable with the term oddball. You know, I just never really got the conventions of life. You know, even as a little kid and a little girl, it was like, you know, it was the early 60s, and there was all this stuff that we were just supposed to like. And every year for Christmas, like, I'd get a doll and I'd look at it, and it did one thing, it peed, and that was sort of the part that was supposed to be fun, is changing the diaper. And even in my quest to sort of make that okay, like, I, I, I'll never forget that I, I got this baby doll, and, and I fed it the bottle, and then I was like, well, wait, if I feed the bottle and it pees, if I take the bottle and put it where it pees, I can also make it barf, <laughs> so with, which I thought was an amazing revelation. So when I went running to my mom with a doll, with a bottle, you know, in the vagina, um, I thought I was greeted with, oh, my God, my daughter is a genius. And instead I was greeted with, oh, my God, my daughter needs psychoanalysis. Um, And so every year as I had an ironing board that was a toy and a stove that was a toy and a refrigerator, basically every appliance my mother would sob over, I was given as a toy. And I thought, this seems weird. Like, what are you trying to do here? You're trying to sell me a bill of goods that is not playing, this is just indentured servitude. You know, why don't you just give me a fake husband, too, and I can play, oh, I've got a drunk of a marriage that's not succeeding, to, you know, and play, the, play out the whole thing. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, so you, so you, I was you, just you, like, weird. That was weird. <laughs> oddball. See, oddball. No, not weird at all. Not weird at all. Oddball. Obviously you know, yeah. very smart and very inventive and what have you. And yeah. your parents recognize that, and do they recognize that in school? Mm. You know? But was school, was that tough for you in, in the early days when you were just a kid? You know, here's what's interesting is um, having a woman sort of want to explore her curiosities and sort of in her way ask for a seat at the table was never really encouraged. And I will never forget, I had a psychology class, and I worked really hard at the exam and um, I was like a B student that kind of didn't put a whole lot of effort in. And so if I put effort in, it was kind of exciting. And so um, I put effort into this test, and I had a whole bunch of the brainiacs in my class. And so I thought, oh, the curve is going to be hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so the teacher, it's male teacher, is passing the test back. And as he's passing the test back, he's talking about how there was one person in class who really um, understood the psychology of people, who did amazing on the test, and he's passing up the test, and I'm not getting my test, and I'm not thinking he's talking about me. I'm thinking, where's my test? Yeah, you forgot my test. And so he says, and the person who really just succeeded me on my wildest expectations about understanding the inner workings of the human mind is Liz Winston. He puts the test down on my desk, and it says A++. And then he says, you know what? Good for you. This means you'll make a great mother one day. <laughs> 
not a great psychologist, not a good reader of people, <laughs> not a, oh, my God, you'll be an amazing leader in business. You'll make a great mother one day. Did you hit him? Like <laughs> no, but I really gave him a look that was like, <sighs> I think I hate you more than anything I've ever hated in my life right now, more than the Lee jeans my mother bought for me instead of the Levi's, more than anything. You <laughs> are awful. Um, and so and that was the kind of thing, I think, if you were to talk to women, then that was in, like, you know, 1976. And if you were to talk to women who grew up at that time, I bet there's a million stories in the Naked City of that kind of backhanded, you know, you'll be good at that role that we predefined for you. So good for you. Instead of being like, oh, my God, that's how you just put me in prison, dude. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's. I think the thing that's interesting about that is, because we've been talking about that uh, recently on a, on a show, is that a lot of kids who grew up today don't even understand what it was like, you know, right. in our growing up. Right. That, and you know, they just take it for granted, which is kind of a sad thing, right? Yeah, I mean, when yeah. you're just desperately saying, and, and, and like in, in the things that I've pursued in my life, I, I sort of, I call it the anvil rule. I can't lift an anvil. I can't carry an anvil. So if I apply for a job, that's carrying an anvil, I'm lying. You shouldn't hire me. But if it's any other job that just requires me succeeding or failing based on my skill set and whether I'm good, I should have the opportunity to succeed or fail. And when you put up these weird roadblocks that don't make any sense, um, then I'm just going to uh, look at you with the jaw to sigh and question you. You know, I'm not going to let it go because it's not fair. I'm not asking it, you it to is. give me anything. I'm just asking you to um, give me a chance to either succeed or fail on my merits. And but we had to fight that, so hard. To that's at the core of everything you want? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, Pretty much. I love it. Not I love even it. hard. Pretty easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I believe me, I understand. It, and, it, 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 you know, it's a, you turned it around, too, by the way, and you made it a good thing because yeah, it impels totally. you. And impels you, absolutely. That's the key also well, in everything that we do. Question. I think it's true. And, uh, yes, yes, yes. No, no, it's a Catholic lady. Oh, yes. Tell me is a funny thing, because comedy a lot is associated with Jewish, with Jews. I'm Jewish, I can say that. And you're a Catholic girl, mm -hmm. and you work with Jews. <laughs> you have but a I'm Catholic also, Jewish mentality? <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I always say that I'm from the 13th tribe. Some people always think I'm a Jew. I'm from that tribe. There's a whole tribe of us where people think you're a Jew. It's like, oh, you're funny, you have dark hair, you're loud. You actually, you know, it's like, wait, what? It just like, Hello. snorted. You made me snore. I know. Um, but it's also a Catholic thing in the sense that, you know, the guilt, I think guilt is the sort of um, overlying thing that brings the people to the comedy. You know, there's not a whole lot of, like, Anglican comedians. <laughs> the Presbyterians are a riot. <laughs> it's kind of like that crazy, you know, domineering mother, faith-based insanity, you know. And I'm the youngest of five kids in the family. And so people, when people say, oh, were you always funny? I was like, I don't know if I was always funny. But I was just desperately in search of a place to complete a sentence because it wasn't happening in my family. It wasn't even happening at the dinner table. It wasn't happening anywhere. So uh, the stage was the place where I could stand there uninterrupted and just get some things out of my off my chest. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I had to go that far. Oh my god, I love it. I think that there's a big. Uh, uh, I think Catholics and Jews. You know, we we have a big G, but all of us on our heads guilt. So I yeah, think that I mean, that's why that's right. It's yeah. true. We have yeah, one guy with a hat. You just have a lot of people with hats. <laughs> and our well, our boy, you got same beanie, same same. Uh, you know, little uh, thing on the top of their head uh, in church and in, in synagogue. You are listening to the Hallie Casser Jane Show. Always available online at HallieCasserJane.com. Today, I'm speaking with Liz Winstead. Um, John Stewart and uh, and and you and the John Stewart Show and the, and the Comedy Central and Daily Show. I mean, where did all this come from? I think it came from. I mean, for me, it came from. Um, observing media, you know, in years before The Daily Show ever happened, I kind of had this epiphany where my act changed from being just sort of an observational comedian to somebody who, it was the night of the first Gulf War, and I was on a blind date with a guy who could not have been a bigger D-bag. I mean, just a total loser. And 
We went on the state and we went and saw the Dolce Vita because I'd never seen it in the big screen. And it should have been my clue. When I said, hey, do you want to go see the Dolce Vita? And the guy goes, oh, isn't that in black and white? I should have just said, oh, wait, I, did I mean I'm never going on a date with you? But no, I'm from Minnesota, so I had to go because I committed to the obligation. So um, we go on the date. He is a total bore, sleeping through the movie, not even understand it. I'm there weeping at the gorgeousness of the film. And then um, he actually said, do you want to go for a drink afterwards? I could have said no, but of course I said yes because I'm passive aggressive and I'm from Minnesota. So we go to this sports bar that he likes, and and instead of sports being on, thank God, it was the night of the first Gulf War, and the whole bar was gathered around the TV. It was the first time that America had actually watched a war um, start in their living room. They actually watched this happen. And if you'll remember, it was just CNN at the time. And there was all of a sudden these shiny graphics and a theme song, and there was that green light, and there was all these really attractive um, correspondents. And I thought to myself, are they reporting in a war or trying to sell me a war? And at that point, my douchey date goes, oh, my God, this is so cool. And wow, how many people in the entire world are watching this right now? and having this emotional reaction, thinking that this is really a miniseries and it's not real life. And if anybody, like, I never even understood what people said, I think I have a calling. At that point, for me, I was like, I think I found a calling with my comedy. I think that if media is trying to do this, what else are they trying to sell me instead of just report me? You know, what else are they compromising on because they take advertising dollars or they're in bed with somebody in the administration? Like, And so I just started following you know, more and more of the news and the media and how they were manipulating us. And I started writing about it more and bringing it to stage. And cut to four years later, when it had become kind of my niche, that some old bosses of mine had become the heads of Comedy Central and said, hey, we want to do a show that's on every day. You know, you're kind of making this your niche. What do you think? And I was like, oh, my God. My dream show is my first show. I can't say no. I'm completely not ready. Um, and so I said yes, diving into uh, Dante's level of every level of hell. Uh, but the one thing I did know for sure was that if we were going to do the show, one thing that hadn't been done before with shows that like, or like Weekend Update or Laugh-In or Smothers Brothers or any show that had sort of done social commentary, that nobody had become the news. You know, the show itself wasn't a character. And so that's one thing I said to them. I said, let's have the show itself be a character. The graphics are a character. The theme song is a character. You know, and, and so when you turn it down, it looks like a real broadcast. When you turn it up, it sounds like a broadcast, but what's coming out of the mouth of the host is something that is sort of the id of human. And they were like, okay, cool. And then we were off to the races. Wow, interesting. I never heard that story Crazy, before. Right? Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great story. But there's a thing about this po the political uh, humor, if you will, that you have to be careful in a way, don't you? Do you worry about that? Because you really, you, you know, you take risks. And, you know, people are crazy out there. You know? well, I think uh, if you're careful, then you're just going to, you can't worry about that. I mean, that's, that's why not many people do it. Um, you do take risks, you do, people are weird, people are nuts, but you want to know what? You don't choose to do this kind of humor. It's in you. You know, it's a fire yeah. in your belly. It's, um, it's just something that you do. And for me, um, I don't even know what those words mean, that you have to be careful, that you have to do anything. I mean, if you have an opinion and you're a woman, um, people want to rip you apart. So you might as well hone it and be able to back it up and make it really smart and sharp and try to effect change with it. Since people are going to, you know, be holding your feet to the fire anyway, you might as well make a difference doing it. You'll forgive me and, 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 and my audience members who are not on the same side of politically as I am, but when I, when I talk about political irresponsibility, I'm thinking in terms of a Rush Limbaugh, if you will. <laughs> let loose on right. stage of the world. That's scary right. stuff to me. Well, it is scary. I mean, it is, you know, it's just, the thing is that I always feel like is with somebody like a Rush or somebody who is sort of this um, firebrand screaming, you know, who never has anybody from the opposing side on, will never go to neutral territory to um, debate somebody who is of the other side of equal um, stature. You know, I just think it's cowardice. It's like, yeah, have your point. If you believe all this stuff that you say, you should be able to defend it. You should be able to be influential with it and persuade people. 
you know, if you're just going to scream at people who think like you, well, you know what? Good for you. Look good Unbelievable. That. So, yeah, well, right. To me, he's just a carnival barker anyway. I mean, you know, I yeah, give him a totally. plaid jacket and, and a beanie on his head and, a, and, and, and let him have at it. Oh, let's get serious for a moment. And that's because you and I share, a, a, you know, a heart for a certain subject. And that is you talk about a little bit in your, new, in your book that I think is fabulous about getting pregnant when you were 17, the first time that you had yeah. sex. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit and talk about uh, Planned Parenthood a little bit. Well, um, I mean, it was... Can you uh, do that all in one sentence? <laughs> gosh, I know. That's a whole lot of... Oh, my God, do we have enough time to cover this whole... We got, we got a minute. Um, yeah, exactly. We got a minute. Want to wrap a minute? Uh, I think for this essay, uh, you should read the book, but I am a staunch supporter of Planned Parenthood because of my own experience and because I feel like it makes no sense in the world that we live in for extremists to say we would like to reduce the number of abortions, and the way to do that is to remove access to affordable health care. If you're going to say that, then you make no sense at all and should not be even at the table talking about stuff. And so um, if you're not going to let science and logic um, play a role in talking about um, reproductive health, then we're all in trouble, you know. Because if you think about it, like, you know, when we all went to school, did you ever study the age of abstinence? <laughs> yes, dear, I was there. <laughs> yes, there never was. But, you know what <laughs> it I mean? Doesn't work. So it's kind of, no, it doesn't work. It's not happening. It's um, fun and it's free. And so if you have those two elements going, it's going to continue. So you might as well keep everybody safe and not burn it as best you can. So it I will say to Dragon that want to And you, 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 you have been out there, uh, you know, for Planned Parenthood and, and, and actually been threatened, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yes, I've, I've, several times. I have been threatened. Um, I have uh, had my life threatened. I had one woman write an article comparing me to Michael Vick. And why does this? Why did Michael Vick have to go to jail? And why? Is she, why does she get to um, walk the earth free, raising money for um, the same sort of thing? And so I did write her an email saying, just want to clarify something for you that Planned Parenthood doesn't pay or provide services that um, allow people to watch fetuses fight to the death in an alley. So I think you were misled. Thank you. Goodbye. Never heard from her again. <sighs> oh, crazy world out there. Oh, my it goodness. Is. Liz. Liz, Liz, how do I thank you for being here? It has been, I wish we had two hours. Maybe you'll come back next, next time. I mean, it's just been too much fun. Liz Winston, by the way, the book is Liz Free and Die. She's from Minneapolis, by the way, and not from New Hampshire. I don't know where that title comes from, but I love it. It is adorable. This book is such a great read. I have oh, to have a copy you. of it. So You're welcome. And it comes it. out in paperback when? May 7th? Is May that 7th. It? Yep, paperback May 7th. 7th. Seventh, okie dokie. Again, Liz Winstead. The book is Liz Free and or Die. It's not Liz and Die. <laughs> Liz Free that or Die. Scary. And a safe flight to L.A., darling. Nice to Thank have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. I've been speaking with comedian, radio and television personality, and blogger Liz Winstead, author of Liz Free or Die, by way of Riverhead Books, a member of the Penguin Group. For more information on Liz Winstead visit her website at lizwinstead.com. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Casser Jane Show. The Hallie Casser Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Casser Jane Show, and you will find us. Of course, podcasts over shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieCasserJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. Oh, and while you're at HallieCasserJane.com, don't forget to visit my blog to read my latest musings. 
I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Kessler Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Kessler Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasserJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Kesser Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Kesser Jane. It's a wrap. Mm-hmm.